I'm going to talk to you today about the famous uh, Hugo Gernsback. Most of you have probably heard of Hugo Gernsback, but I want to give you uh, what I call the lead, the perspective, the, the setup, and then I'll tell you some of the things that Gernsback did that mostly uh, concern radio broadcasting. Now, here's what I wrote in an article for the uh, CHRS Journal maybe, um, gee, I don't know, eight or nine years ago uh, to introduce uh, an article I wrote on Gernsback. I said this, radio broadcasting evolved over a five-year period from 1919 to 1924, from code to voice and music, from earphones to loudspeakers, from hams to citizen audiences. This is what we're all about here. Publisher Hugo Gernsback had one foot in the past and the other in the future, with the vision of radio broadcasting slightly ahead of his time. Beginning with the amateur-oriented publication Modern Electrics in 1908, Gernsback, after World War I, went on to publish the most popular radio theme magazine of all time. That's Radio News. Beginning in 1919, he began to predict the evolution of amateur and experimental wireless into entertainment broadcasting for an audience. Gernsback was early in his editorial discussion of radio music, news, advertising, government control, the entire radio business from programming to manufacture of radios themselves. His receiver, his readership was quite broad. It wasn't just manufacturers or tech people, it was also curious people. And uh, this, we have a television exhibit using Gernsback material downstairs. Okay, so that's kind of the setup. Well, here's the prolific publisher. <laughs> Thank you. Gernsback published about 50 magazines, different magazines, and they ranged from electricity to sex. And after he lured famous <laughs> sci-fi writers, we'll get to the sex in a second, the famous sci-fi writers of the day to amazing stories, he, were, he, the, uh, he became the father of science fiction, right? And uh, the Hugo Awards were named after him, and they are still awarded today. You'd be interested in the first works by Gernsback, Modern Electric and Electrician and Mechanics. Uh, and Gernsback also sold radio parts by mail, because if you lived in the boondocks, which many people did, and you wanted to build a radio, uh, Gernsback had the, uh, I think it was the Electro Importing Company, right? And we, we probably have some of it, this in, in the library, because we have a lot of Gernsback stuff down there. Okay. Sexology. Well, amazing stories we talked about. Uh, kinky and kooky excerpts for you in the back row that cannot read this. Sexology, and there were some other sex magazines that Gernsback did, um, and they were probably educational more than anything else. They probably weren't what you think. But these were the kind of magazines that we had to hide from our parents, if you remember back in the 40s and 50s, or perhaps our parents were also hiding their copies. I think that's probably true. Okay. Well, anyway, let's get to the point of all this. The magazine that you know best is Radio News. And um, first it was Radio Amateur News, and that lasted from 1919 to 1920. You can see it uh, in the masthead there, Radio Amateur News, and that lasted for about two years. And uh, this is Gernsback. Okay, what Gernsback began to do, he always editorialized. And his editorial in this particular one, he talked about, he railed against government control of broadcasting. And right about that time, if you remember, after the war, about 1919, 1920, the Navy was about to grab broadcasting, or, or grab all radio. Uh, it ended up, of course, in the Commerce Department, but it almost went with the Navy. It was very close, they tell me. And, um, well, here's something that uh, Gernsback did not invent. Uh, this is a 1919 issue where he predicts opera on the radio. Now, Lee DeForest did that um, earlier in 1907. He predicted and wanted beautiful music. In his case, it was opera. Well, here's uh, quite a bizarre thing that uh, was in this issue, particular issue of Gernsback's radio news. The idea was that you could send opera picture and voice coast to coast. Now, it seems fairly simple, but again, we're talking about 1919, 1920, there were only silent movies, okay? So Ger the way Gernsback did this, he said, we'll get a theater, we'll invite people to see the opera singers, the singers will be on stage, and we will film them just with the proscenium arch of the stage. We won't edit or anything like that. We'll film them with a silent camera, right? Um, and we'll, we'll film them, and, and then we'll play it back when, when the film is processed, and they can lip sync, to it, 
and the audience at home can, can hear radio and the people in the theater can see the actual people. Now, the way that it was worked, this happened, started in New York, but he sent a copy to San Francisco. So San Francisco was on the network. They got the uh, music singing and somebody there, it wouldn't be easy, tried to synchronize that so they could uh, continue doing it that way. So this is, this is some of the things that uh, Gernsback did and he read, he wrote something here. He said, the underlying idea is not only to give grand opera by wireless, listen to the music and to the singers only, but to actually see the operatic stars on the screen as well. This is how it can be readily accomplished by means which are available today. He means a coast-to-coast -coast link for live audio, for radio, and also for silent film. Meanwhile, DeVorest was working on a sound reader. Anyway, available today without the slightest technical difficulty. And this is what uh, Gernsback said about it. Anyway, he continues to talk about content for radio. Uh, in this case, it's a radio dance. And uh, th this, this happened, um, this was in the 1920s, still radio amateur news. And uh, what he said here is, as will be noted, each young man and his dancing partner are equipped with a pair of radio receiving headphones and connecting cords suspended from various parts of the room, thus enabling them to cover a considerable part of the floor. You just have to picture all those wires being tangled up, and a man and woman dancing close with uh, um, headphones. Rather an odd idea. Gernsback now predicts the way radio is going to be in 1945. And this is in 1920, July it says here. Uh, and in July 1920, you see the masthead and cover logo has been changed to reflect uh, the coming of the uses of radio more like we know it today. Um, and the amateur has taken off. So even though the amateurs were what made radio happen probably what it did for lots of reasons before the capitalists took over, uh, in this case, at least, uh, Ernst back was with them. Anyway, he predicts radio in 1945. Some of these are correct. One, we will no longer need an aerial and a ground wire. Well, that's a big deal because you needed one in the early days of radio. You needed a way to separate stations. It was very complex. Um, but anyway, Gernsback said, by 1945, we won't need it. Um, the second thing, we will be able to see radio waves. Well, why would you want to see radio waves anyway? <laughs> there they are, Mom. Okay, anyway. Radio, radio waves. So, but anyway, uh, maybe he meant television, and certainly by 1925, Gernsback was promoting television, as you'll see in some of the graphics we have downstairs uh, for our uh, slide presentation. Okay. If you see me up close, um, admire my badge. I have one of the original, I still have it, original black and white versions of the CHRS badge. So people say, I have a badge. I've got a, you probably have one too, don't you, Steve? One. Okay. All right, so, so now we're talking about radio concerts because people are realizing that it's easy to play music on the radio. People will be entertained by it. Um, and what he says here, there's nothing that popularizes radio more than a concert by a famous singer. And it is to be hoped that our amateurs, as well as professionals, he still has one foot in the amateur world thinking about that, the kids building sets for their parents and one foot in the uh, not quite regulated or, or defined uh, radio. Anyway, they shall band together and try for some original ideas. And he suggests a few. He thinks uh, countless schemes and ideas make it possible to popularize radio. <coughs> okay, next. Okay, here's something that you probably say, oh yeah, of course, we know about this. Radio news. He talks about radio news. Well, this is not what you think because you think, probably, as we think right now, uh, that there, there's a guy from KCBS on a cell phone and he's broadcasting live and the guy out on the board back at the station is uh, putting it on all over the air and that's instant news as it happens. You probably think it's that way, but that's not the way it is. Back here, this guy with the shortwave receiver was reporting a fire and the person who was receiving it was the city editor at the newspaper who would have it written up and put out an extra on the street. And this is how we thought about radio news back then. We thought somehow we'd use the radio, but we wouldn't use it in the way that you think we're using it. So, I mean, the Gerns back was very early. I mean, this stuff was very, very early. Okay, so in uh, 1920, I believe, or this was uh, 1920, profiles of stations, including the well-known 
deforestation at the California theater, which was um, not real. It was, I mean, it was, it was real, but it was a, uh, um, not, not a permanent call letter, but an experimental one, a 6X. It was 6XC. It was on before KDKA by a year, but uh, the East Coast is where radio began. I suspect we, we know that. We don't have anything against them. The people, when I go to conferences, the people who represent Pittsburgh and KDKA, uh, they say, man, I can't get any respect. No one cares about Frank Conrad, just like we used to say about Charles Harold, and still do, so. And, and divorce for, to some extent. Okay, now, um, music will popularize radio. This is what Gernsback says. And uh, here it is, you know, there's one radio in town. And he also warned problems, he warned radio manufacturers to quit making crappy radios, okay? And, and you can see why some of the radios were not so good. And, and then here's something that we already know, but Gernsback sort of did this before a lot of us. And he says, or writes in his editorial, indeed, radio engineers, as well as the entire technical radio fraternity today, bend every effort towards simplifying every radio to such an extent that it will come into the class of the phonograph and the automobile. When did we say that the last time? The 70s when computers came in? Nobody's gonna want computers because they're too complex. Well, put it in a phone, you know, make, make it something you can touch, a typewriter, make it good. And uh, that's what Steve Jobs did for us. All right, getting to the end here. 1922, Gerns back is hopeful of the radio Manufacturing? Well, advertising by radio, can it and should it be done? There were some people, and KDKA was, was early saying this, that because my company is Westinghouse and we have this RCA stuff with GE and the RCA, um, what do you call that, the octopus. Well, anyway, but, but um, they thought we would, say we would support radio by using, um, using advertising, or not advertising, but using sales of radios. Well, people only could buy so many radios, so that wasn't a good idea. Uh, DeForest thought that uh, radio should be free if it has uh, classical music. Well, who would pay for it? He didn't, he didn't say, and he also didn't say government either because uh, he was not that way. If you read my DeForest book in the 1940s, DeForest wrote a, a letter to Congress telling them not to pass a universal health care bill. Seriously, it's in the book. I know you all read it. All right, um, again, here's another issue that we probably have, that you've heard about, and that this was in 1923, and this is what Gernsback says in his editorial called Music Versus Radio. Think, as we have for the past few years, it's uh, music versus internet and streaming, but here's what Gernsback said a whole lot of decades ago. The whole country has been watching with interest and we believe with considerable annoyance as well, the fight between the music publishers and authors conducted against radio broadcasting stations. The controversy has always been radio stations over here. Well, if I play your record, you'll sell it, you'll make lots of money, uh, and if I keep playing it, you'll sell more and more records. The person over here. Well, maybe that's true, but also uh, we have this uh, radio station that wants to play this but we also want people to buy it too. And if they hear it on the radio, they won't buy it. So this, this is an issue that started 100 years ago and it's still, still going strong today. 100 years ago, can you imagine? Uh, radio to supplant universities, we hope not. Um, radio's heyday, and there was a school, I, I, I did the uh, book called History of Columbus Radio, uh, Columbus, Ohio Radio, and, the, and WOSU, the uh, University Station uh, of uh, Ohio State University, where I graduated from, my school, um, my hometown, so I had to go there, it was cheap. Uh, it was a good school, actually, a very good school. They had a radio station which was foremost in radio education. They actually had a degree, and they had a two-year school they called like a community college of the air, and I'm not sure how, whether it was transferable, probably not, knowing uh, how well, you have to go through the transfer. But anyway, they did it. Uh, and they were very important and very popular, but it's kind of boring. Well, then in, um, and the idea was to reach people who couldn't come to campus. They could just stay at home, like this guy here, in bed, and you could be listening to radio, and you get a college education without leaving your home. Well, it doesn't work. Um, anyway, um, in the 50s, 
we had education by television, where a lot of these marginal public stations, uh, and it was boring stuff too, I don't know if you ever saw it or not, but it was an old professor <laughs> with a blackboard uh, talking about math, just like today, except it's, we're in color today. What can I say? The old professor is always showing around. Anyhow, uh, that didn't work necessarily, but it was okay. And um, this, in 1925, became the first biography of Lee DeForest. Uh, more, more of an autobiography because he, he uh, it says here actually under the personal direction of Dr. DeForest, biography recorded by Arvin of Radio News. But it, basically DeForest told his story and it was uh, serialized in about six different issues. So, so that, that's that. Okay, so um, I don't know if you have any questions or comments. You probably know about this. Uh, uh, if you can find the CHRS journal that has the article I wrote about this, and if you're interested, uh, you could ask Bart about the library downstairs because we have all the Gernsback stuff down there. And it's all very interesting. And uh, again, he was the prescient publisher. That's it. Thank you.